All right, Alexander, let's answer a lot of the questions that we had from the uh, community, Odyssey, uh, Rumble, YouTube, and our locals community with uh, the live stream that we had uh, with Scott Ritter. And uh, we've got quite a few questions, good questions, and we'll try to answer as best we can the questions that we've uh, received. And let's just uh, jump right into it. David sent us a super chat. Thank you, David. And Linda sent us a super sticker. And Linda sent us another super sticker. And Elaine said, can't thank you enough for reading the awful media so that I don't have to and doing a fantastic research. I wouldn't want to miss anything you both post. I'm amazed by your cheerful, kind optimism. Thank you, Elaine, for that. Thank you, Valley S, for that super chat. Mitt P says, I got my wine and cheese all set for the video. Putin is probably listening to you guys also. Thank you for that. Mitt P, thank you, Zarael, for that super sticker. And we have a question here, a uh, question for Scott Ritter, but we'll, we'll try to answer it. Since Moscow is roughly 260 miles east of the Ukraine border, wouldn't it be correct to assume that the Russian assets attached in the north were to disrupt any possible attempt that the Ukraine could make a Hail Mary attempt at Moscow. Seems with the muddy season upon us, any pushes by Ukraine against Moscow are awash. It, it's now time to tighten up supply lines and consolidate. Well, I, I, I think that... I, well, I, I think that's probably, go on. You're going to say... You're gonna say no, Alex. I was just going to say, maybe for the mainstream media, they would, they would talk yeah, about yeah. marching on Moscow, but... Moscow, yeah. <laughs> Uh, 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 I always say the first law of war is don't march on Moscow, and the second law of diplomacy is don't bluff Beijing. It's one of my fundamental rules. I suppose there might have been some people in Ukraine who were demented enough to think of that. But I don't really think this was ever a real plan on anybody's part in Ukraine. I cannot imagine that they seriously imagined that they could march on Moscow. And I just think this is a... So, I mean, obviously, um, you know, there might be people who talk like that, but I, and maybe in the media they talk like that, but I don't think anybody in the Ukrainian armed forces ever contemplated that. And I don't think the Russians ever really saw that as a real risk. And I don't think that was what governed their plan. I mean, obviously, it was a question addressed to Scott. And note that over his long discussion... He never at any point said that he thought that this move was intended to protect Moscow or Russian territory. As far as he was concerned, and this is, of course, confirmed by what the Russians have been saying, it was all a diversion to keep Ukrainian troops pinned down defending Kiev. And I think, you know, that's, that corresponds with my understanding of events as well. Can I just make one further observation? And this flows very much from what... Uh, Scott said, and it's also um, uh, uh, it, 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 it also corresponds with my information. Scott Ritter made the point that the Russians have committed forty thousand men to clearing Mariupol. Now, Mariupol has a population of between three and four hundred thousand, or at least did before the war. It's a fairly, you know, it's a big city, but it's not enormous, and it's garrison was 14,500 men, according to the Russians. So it needed 40,000 men to clear a city, 400,000 people with a garrison of 14,500 men. Now, Scott Ritter also said that the total size of the Russian force parked outside Kiev was around 40 to 50,000 men. Not that different, in other words, from the size of the force clearing Mariupol. Kiev, before the war, had a population of three and a half million. It's a vast, sprawling metropolitan area, bigger, apparently, than New York City. You do not storm, as Scott Ritter said. You do not just have, you, you don't just use 50,000 men to storm a city of that size. And I'm guessing that the Ukrainian forces committed to defending Kiev would have been orders of magnitude more numerous than the ones in Mariupol. So you think about it, I think Scott Ritter's analysis must be correct. And of course, it corresponds with what the Russians themselves have been saying. Mm. All right, KM944 says, what WMD did Saddam Hussein actually have? Mm -hmm. I don't think he well, really had anything, to be honest. He didn't have any. I mean, that was the point. I mean, he did, he did, he did use chemical weapons in his war against uh, Iran, 
and in some of his wars against the Kurds. And these were, by the way, old-fashioned chemical weapons of the kind that were developed in the Second World War, sarin and uh, th that kind of thing. He, he didn't have any sophisticated chemical weapons, such as he could have seriously used in a conflict with the United States, and he, he didn't have them in either Gulf War. All right. Uh, Jeanette said, if you were going to leave the USA, where would you go? Russia, Serbia, or Hungary? I would go to Hungary at the moment, well. but I've heard that Serbia is a pretty You can't really place. go to Russia uh, anymore. You can't go to Russia anymore, no, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that leaves you, your choice would be mm -hmm. Serbia or Hungary. Serbia or Hungary. Apparently, I, I, I've been to Serbia, I've never been to Hungary. Hungary is apparently an amazing country, and it has a superb cuisine, by the way. But so does Serbia, so, you know, I'm not going to make I think it you guess. can't go wrong with either of the two. No. Yeah. It's a shame that you can't go to Russia anymore. Anyway, uh, thank you for that uh, super chat. Uh, Euro Gabor said, good morning, indeed, gentlemen. Four years of Orban for me, four years of overtime for the therapist for Uncle George. Life is good. The next in line is Imran Khan. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I, well, we'll see what happens. Pakistan, by the way, I should say Alex uh, has done some amazing updates on the situation in Pakistan, which you can find on his channel. Deserves a big discussion. We're going to see what happens because as, a, as we're making this program, I think the Pakistan Supreme Court is still looking at whether this dissolution decree of the uh, Pakistan parliament is legal or not. But of course, if it, is, if it is legal, I don't really see why it wouldn't be, and there are elections, then of course this regime change operation will have failed. And then we will see whether the US puts pressure on the military in Pakistan to step in, which of course has happened before. So this is really actually very, very ugly. And, you know, the US says it's protecting democracy. It's undermining democracy because they're under no doubt at all. It's the US that has engineered this affair. They've got regime change crazy. They really have. Yeah. Uh, Waldo says uh, it was a great stream. Thank you very much, Waldo, for that. And uh, Ihan 101 says, uh, can Scott comment on rumors that Putin has Parkinson's? Yeah, I well, we I don't think Scott would, but I can, I, I can comment on them. I mean, I, I, there have been rumors about Putin's ill health since very soon after he became Russia's leader. Um, all I will say is just look at how hard the man works. It doesn't suggest to me a man who's not in good health. Apparently, and according to the Wall Street Journal, he confirmed it himself um, the day before he signed the decree recognizing the two republics of the Donbass. He was talking uh, with Macron up to three o'clock in the morning in Moscow. And then he convened a big meeting of the Security Council, the Russian Security Council, which is all televised. And then he made a big speech afterwards. I mean, he did look tired, but he certainly didn't look ill. And he's never looked ill to my mind, at all unwell. And I've had dealings with people who have Parkinson's, and there's no sign, to my mind, that Putin has Parkinson's. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for that awesome super sticker. Summer of 1970, thank you for that super sticker. Jay Galt says, Black Pill. Uh, Scott says the CIA is anti-American, but they are the true rulers of America, JFK. No politician can survive blackmail party pressure, and the cost of taking on national security state. Mm. Well, I think... What was that, that, um, that Chuck yeah, Schumer yeah. phrase, Alexander? Six yeah, uh, ways about Trump? Yeah, um, six ways it, to... Uh, six uh, days uh, of the uh, week uh, and two ways to Sunday. Something like that. Yeah, whatever it was. But anyway, did you basically that warning to Trump. Intelligence, you know, intelligence services. I mean, that was what he was saying. Um, I, 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 I think this point that Scott Ritter was making was that CIA people consider themselves to be in you know very strong patriots and that they um, would never consciously betray the united states especially not to a foreign power because patriotism and i'm a somebody who you know is all in favor of it but you've got to be always understanding of what it means and what i th what i think has happened in the united states in the u.s deep state is that you will find all sorts of people there who consider themselves to be patriots, but who also believe that they are the people who understand best what US interests are 
and are therefore prepared to take extreme steps, including breaking the law, in order to protect what they see are the interests of the United States. Now, that is wholly wrong. And, of course, if it is a patriotism, a form of patriotism, it is a profoundly corrupted one. Patriotism is to be found in adhering to the Constitution and the laws of the United States. And I'm afraid many people in the CIA, as far as I can see, and in the intelligence community generally, don't. All right. Uh, JJHW says, I hope Scott is taking ample precautions as he is going against the narrative. Head on a swivel and Moscow rules don't end up like David Kelly. Um, I'm sure Scott Bal takes every precaution. Yes. <laughs> Valkajan says, actually, I think we answered this question right here. Has Scott any independent analysis on the failed helicopter escape from Mariupol? Who and what? We, we did answer this. We did on, answer this. I on mean, the I helicopter think Scott's Mariupol. given a detailed discussion of it, yeah. Yeah, uh, Possum Power, support from an American. Thank you very much, Possum Power. Guy, thank you for that super sticker. Christoph, thank you for that super sticker. Sparky says, Stuttgart American High School rules over K-Town. Thank you very much for that. Sparky and Cenobite says, Mr. Ritter, assuming Russian forces win the Donbass cauldron battle, if Zelensky doesn't capitulate, military speaking, what then? We talked about I, this as well, but... I think I mean, he, we did talk about this. I mean, the point that... Yeah. Uh, Scott Ritter made is that at that point the entire political environment in Ukraine will have changed completely and I think that's entirely right. Yeah and Sparky says Scott went to a school in K-Town. <laughs> that was his previous super chat. Thank you for that. Sparky Zariel says can Scott elaborate on the attack of the oil refinery and why no one will take responsibility? Thanks. Well I think we just, he did well, discuss too. that yeah. at length. Yeah. I'm going to give an, I'm going to give my own theory by the way about why they didn't take responsibility. I think there was a tacit agreement, or perhaps even an express agreement between the Russians and the Ukrainians, that if you don't attack our oil refineries, we won't attack yours. And what happened directly after that Russian oil refinery in Belgorod was attacked was that the Russians launched strikes against Ukraine's two biggest oil refineries in Kremenchuk and in um, Odessa. So I think that somebody in Kiev violated, went against this implicit agreement that had been made. And I think that the Ukrainians, were, that's why they were unhappy and why this was a rogue operation as... Um, as uh, Scott Ritter described it. I think this is a rogue operation carried out by somebody. They launched this attack on the refinery in Russia, and the result was that the Ukrainian refineries, the two big Ukrainian refineries, got attacked in retaliation. And um, there may be a clue as to who those people who made that decision were, because shortly after that attack, uh, Zelensky sacked two generals, a fact which has not been explained properly. So uh, that's my own guess, that it violated this understanding. And that's why the Ukrainians were unhappy. Um, and um, I would, I would say that if that was the case, then it might also explain if there was some kind of understanding like that in place, that might also explain why the Russians hadn't taken sufficient pre precautions to protect their refinery from attack. All right. Uh, Pax Mundi says, Scott Ritter did more to override the avalanche of administration and media-supported lies that pushed the U.S. into catastrophic war on Iraq than anyone else. Yeah, it's true enough. He, tr he told Absolutely. truth to power. He told truth to power. What a, what a soldier is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, does uh, Scott Ritter have any old colleagues as WMD inspector? Who he's disappointed with. Ask him that. Why don't I don't they know? Speak I don't know. Like you do. I'll, I'll ask that. I'll ask. Well, if Scott's when I next watching this, him, which... I'll ask that question. Um, she's watching yeah, this. We'll, we'll share this video with Scott. So, yeah, and, and we'll share this video with Scott. So maybe he'll comment yeah. in the comment section below as well. Um, Ritter was the one author authoritative voice on a no WMD in Iraq as a weapons. Inspector. Absolutely, I remember. Yeah, I remember him. I remember, you know, getting up in the morning and over my morning coffee listening to him on BBC Radio, talking sense and being ignored. Hmm. 
Uh, Not K- by everybody. KRM, I, I paid a lot of attention to what he was saying, but um, the uh, political class wouldn't listen to him. Mm. Uh, KRM944 says, thank you for bringing him on. Maybe Patrick Lancaster one day. Yes, we're working on getting oh, yeah. Patrick as well. Um, Fulmati uh, says, will um, the takeover... No, I think the easiest person to reach at the moment, given that he's in Ukraine in a war zone. So, But, you know, one day we will definitely try. Yeah. Uh, Fulmati says, will the takeover of Kiev be with Russian paratroopers and special forces? Will the war spread to the Baltics because of Sweden, uh, neutrality and gas pipe sabotage? I don't think so. I don't think this is on the agenda at the moment. And my own guess is that if there is a intention by the Russians to take Kiev, it will be organised in a radically different way, in a much more methodical way than the one we saw. Uh, well, well, we, we, you know, we, you know, uh, you know, we'll just be paratroopers flying in and things of this kind. They'll first encircle the place and they'll take it step by step, and quarter by quarter, and be very methodically and uh, systematically done with large numbers of troops over a protracted period. It may be a major battle. Uh, Jutar DKGB says, I'm curious if Scott thinks that is, if Scott thinks that this is any, le- that there is any legacy of Soviet deep operations theory developed by the Kachevsky being utilized by the Russian army currently in this war. That is an absolute question for Scott Ritter. Tukhachevsky, and the other, the only other thing I know about this, because I'm not an expert on deep battle and all those theories, but is that, of course, the, the actual apparently theorist and intellectual in the Russian general staff who came up with all these ideas of deep battle in the, 19, in the 1930s was a man called Triandafilov, who, that's a Greek name, and it turns out that he was a Greek. So deep battle is apparently something conceived by a Greek. But anyway, look, this is something definitely for Scott Ritter. I'm not going to venture into debates about deep battle. I don't know whether Alex has any thoughts about this. No, no, I think there's something for yeah. for Scott. Once again, if he's watching this, maybe he'll comment in the comment section as well. Uh, G. Jetta says, what's the best way to conduct a truly independent investigation of this village? In Kiev, we answered right. this actually. We Forensic. answered it. I mean, the, the very first thing. I mean, it should be done. It should have been done within hours. There should have been an immediate meeting of the Security Council. The Security Council should have been po- appointed independent investigators. People should have been rushed to the site. The uh, crime scene should have been secured, and uh, you know, proper a proper forensic team should have been brought in to study, photograph, examine the crime scene and conduct proper autopsies on the bodies. And this is, you know, something you can do very fast. Um, I've seen it done, and I know how fast it can be done, if the will is there. Karolius Defect says, how deep are Russian military reserves? Will the patience displayed and honed in Syria continue towards the west of Ukraine, or would that become a bear trap, given the West's continuing material deployment? I think this is, again, something which we'll pass on to Scott. My own personal view is that the Russian reserves are not limitless. They're more than sufficient for whatever operation the Russians have in mind in Ukraine. Uh, Tsunami Bond says, wasn't the Russian attack from Crimea mainly a marine line attack? How come the Ukrainians didn't manage to defend or counterattack against that? Leader incompetence or overwhelmed inability? It's a very good question, actually. Again, I, I that may be more one for Scott. But it was I, a whole different. I, yeah, go on. No, it was also a whole different scenario back then. Was it? I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not sure what's been discussed here. Whether it's the 2014 Crimea affair or the offence that, yeah, the 20, that was yeah. launched. Yes, it was the Crimean the affair Crimea. in 2014. That it was completely different. It was a completely different scenario and a completely different situation in Crimea because the Russian troops were, of course, already there and the Ukrainians were very disorganized and uncertain how to respond. This is a completely different war which has been prepared over many years. If you're talking about the southern offensive that the Russian army launched very successfully from Crimea into southern Ukraine over the last few weeks, well, that's, uh, uh, that is obviously a very different kind of operation. Uh, over, I suspect, very much easier terrain. And that clearly was part 
of an actual offensive, basically firstly to um, take Mariupol and then move on to encircle the Ukrainian forces in Donbass. Yeah, Karolius Defect says, if Zelensky is a prisoner of his cabal and his bodyguard, when it's all over, he is not more useful as a martyr to the cause. Do you think he is aware of the danger he is in? I'm absolutely sure he's aware of the danger he's in. And I would say this, I saw a photograph recently of Zelensky um, going on a tour, looking at you know the place where all these things have happened, and he was surrounded by people, armed men. And I have to say, again, he looked... I thought very, very, very sad and rather frightened. That was my own interpretation of that photograph. Others may not agree. Mm. Yeah, he did not look good he at didn't all. He did look good, no. Yeah, um, let's see. Uh, from Tony says, how much do you think the West helping the battle, providing intelligence, actually directing what they do? I think it is providing a huge amount of advice and help. I mean, to give an example... Um, and it was one that Scott Ritter touched on. The helicopter raid on the refinery almost certainly happened because the Western powers were able to give um, Ukraine, the whoever it was who launched this strike, information about gaps in uh, Russian radar coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, Jeff Rich says, uh, I would love to ask Scott for advice to we citizens of many nations about how to endure the information war, especially over the next month. I have to drop off, but I will watch later after I sleep. The information war, that's a tough one. Information, information war, well, like, what can we say? Come to the Duran, <laughs> we do our best. Yeah. That's a tough one. Mm. Uh, Real Lot No Sense says, Colonel McGregor said a couple of days ago, Russia's military is exceptionally prepared for offensive operations. Do you agree? Yeah, I think I think Scott Ritter said exactly that. I mean, he said that, you know, this is obviously a maneuver battle and that the Russians seem to be very, very well organized for it. Alan Watson says, I'm afraid all of this is being encouraged by the West. Absolutely. Of course it is. No question about this. I mean, we've had this long story in the Wall Street Journal about the negotiations and the discussions and uh, and the fact that Olaf Scholz came up with this blundering idea right at the end of telling Zelensky, drop your NATO bid. And Macron seized on it and was trying to set up a summit meeting between Putin and Biden. And of course, Biden wasn't interested. <laughs> yeah. DG, DGC Zero says, question for Scott, how long, in his opinion, before the surrounded Ukrainian Eastern Task Force will surrender and... Will they have to fight the one Nationalist Battalion in each brigade before they can surrender? I think we talked about this as well. Yeah, I think we did, actually, yes. I mean, I, I don't think we should commit ourselves to any deadlines because, I mean, you know, in a, in a battle situation, whoever can. Yeah. There's a question here about, does anyone know how many troops are catching the coup? This is a serious question. That's, That's a good a question. question. It's a very good yeah. question. What I would say is this. Um, um, the Russians provide information about the incidence of the coup in Russia. And it's now almost very low. And it seems to be going down. So, I mean, I don't know what other, what, what the general situation in, is, in that, in, is in that part of the world. But at the moment, it seems to have run its course, at least in Russia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, KM944 says, how could Russian intelligence be poor? The ability for Russians to embed as spies is seamless. They are fluent in the language and the culture. I'm sure, I'm sure that's right. Mm. What, what, if anything, is left in the Ukraine command and control structure? Not much, I imagine. Not much, <laughs> as far as one can tell. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Tweak says, Swedish media claims that a number of different intelligence services, including the CIA, are currently carrying out operations inside Ukraine. And I wonder if this is something that other Western powers have openly admitted. My impression was that the West was, car was actually denying any claims that they would have any military personal operatives working inside of Ukraine right now. But maybe I've gotten this all wrong. No, they are denying it. But of course, we don't know how much weight to place on those denials. I can remember back in 2011 during the Libyan conflict, that there was all sorts of denials that there were any Western troops in 
Libya and then a whole group of SAS soldiers uh, um, were, um, you know, detected there by local people. So, you know, I, I'm sure there are Western personnel and people in Ukraine, but it's certainly not something you will find at all discussed in the British media. What's being said elsewhere, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is kind of the, the public and private uh, position, you know, even, even Zelensky said it. In, in public, yeah. he was told to yeah. say, we're, we're joining NATO in private. They told him, you're not. So I think it's the same thing in public. Exactly. They're saying, yeah. we're, we're not at all involved in Ukraine, but in private, we all know yes. what's going yes. on. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Alan Watson says, why does fascism linger in southeastern Europe? I don't know that it lingers in much of southeastern Europe. I mean, there are some people in... Um, Greece and wherever who are of those views. I don't know that they're a vast proportion of the population. If you're talking about Ukraine, well, I think there are very specific factors connected with the history of that country and the support that these forces have had from outside that explain it. Uh, GTARD KGB says Poland knows they can't survive a war against Russia. January 2022, the Polish army held war games simulating a Russian offensive through the Sowaki Gap called Winter 20. Yeah, I've heard the same. I, I, I don't think that, I mean, I think this idea of a war in Ukraine, uh, I mean, it's interesting that there's been no decision apparently taken to send, um, you know, visible formations of NATO troops into Ukraine. And I think that's going to stick. I'm going to say something here. I think um, Orban's massive victory in Hungary, and can I just say, I mean, you know, we'll do a separate program on this, but this is a huge win. I mean, just a few months ago, it was, you know, people were talking seriously that he would lose, and he didn't just win. He won, you not only won big, he's increased his majority. Now, that surely was because he doesn't, he's so strongly opposed to sending... Hungarian troops, Western troops, NATO troops into Ukraine. And I think that will have acted as a message across Europe that European electorates are not keen on that idea at all. Yeah. Uh, Sats 8 says, if Russia takes Odessa, they will continue to Transnistria. Well, it's not far. <laughs> I think that's probably, probably true. I think, I, I, I must admit, I think if they do take Odessa, it's a, we, they're not there yet, let me stress, but if they do take Odessa, then, I mean, you know, they will link up with their forces in Transnistria. I don't think there's any question then. Uh, Danich says, Ritter's uh, assessment of China-Taiwan is right on, in my view. Yeah. I think so too, actually. I think he's got it exactly right. It'd be a very different war, by the way, from the one we're seeing in Ukraine. The, la the war in Ukraine is a land war. The war in Taiwan, obviously they'll be fighting on the island itself, but, I mean, this would be a naval air operation, primarily. Yeah. Ronald B. One says, which Alexander US said before Marine, the Ukraine... Sorry, one which a U.S. Marine would understand probably better than almost anyone else, which is what, of course, Scott Ritter uh, was. Ronald B. says, Alexander said before the Ukraine invasion that Taiwan should negotiate with China now and get the best deal they can. They would have gotten a much better deal if they had taken Alexander's advice at the time. Mm -hmm. And so would Ukraine if they'd also taken my advice. <laughs> and not just my advice, many people's advice. And if the West had followed that advice too. I mean, if the West had come, what I was constantly talking about was agreeing a geopolitical ceasefire. Well, I think... The opportunity for that has gone. Ronald says, what happened to all the bribes that China, that China paid to Biden and the U.S. leader class? Are they conspiring to give China this sort of advantage? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, that's a big question. Um, that's perhaps a, a question to be looked at when we eventually do a program on Biden's increasing legal problems in the United States, which are getting more severe. I saw that Jonathan Turley now is calling for special counsel to be appointed. And I'm sure there's ground, ground swell of this is going to intensify. I think that Biden is clearly now caught in a very difficult position. If he starts taking 
positions that are seen as sympathetic to China is going to bring out many of his problems even further. Fang 33 says Biden got NATO members to spend more, though, something Trump could not do. Well, except we'll see whether they really do, because bear in mind, we're in a Europe where there is a cost of living, living crisis and which is heading into recession. I mean, heading fast into recession. The United States is not there yet. Though it will eventually catch up. But Europe is in a very, very bad way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Yov, thank you for that. Super chat. Frank, thank you for that. Super chat. Vasca, thank you very much. Lakeva, thank you very much. Deliopoulos says, what do you think an end to the U.S. hegemony would mean for countries like Australia and Canada that are resource-rich but rely on the U.S. for their defense? What can they do to correct course? Make peace with the other countries in the Pacific. I mean, I, I don't want to sound again. I mean, I don't want to predict too far. But I mean, why would China want to conquer Australia? Surely the better thing to do would be to come to terms. Hmm. Commander Crossfire says, uh, this is a quote, the great questions of the day will not be settled by means of speeches and majority decisions, but by iron and blood. Otto von Bismarck. Mm. To the uh, Prussian parliament, by the way. Yeah. TT, thank you for that super sticker. Piano Man, thank you for that super sticker. Kaliu25 says, uh, actually, I think we answered this, but so the false flag that you guys were talking about happened over the weekend. I really hope that it was a Hollywood production and the evidence seems to point towards this and not the real massacre. What a mess. What a mess, indeed. Mm -hmm. The old one says, if Finland and Sweden joins NATO, does it mean World War III? Finland is is very close now, Alexander. I agree. Without a referendum as well. Without a referendum. Without a referendum, I saw that too, yeah, which is very interesting. We'll just have to see. Uh, We won't start World War III. And to to stress again, it is not as fundamental to Russia as Ukraine is. Tatiana Kopel, thank you for that super sticker. K1F says, uh, Scott could weigh in on a McGregor-McMaster debate within the Pentagon. Yes. Well... (laughs) <laughs> During Trump's term, I think. McMaster yeah. and uh, McGregor, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, McMaster is a hardline neocon. McGregor is the opposite. I mean, there's no doubt at all which is the more intelligent man, in my opinion. And I think in any real debate, McGregor would win hands down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it switch says, good to have you, Scott. And the Duran, Alex, Alex, too. Thank you very much for that. Sanjeva says, thanks, Duran and Scott Ritter. Thank you very much for that, Sanjeva. Leon, thank you for that super sticker. Thomas says, thanks, guys. Ralph says, uh, I think we talked about this as well, but he says, Mr. Ritter, a claim. Hussein pre-signaled to the U.S. his takeover, uh, putative repatriation of Kuwait and took the lack of response as a green light. Gulf War, that's justified. Any truth to that? Thanks for your work. Well, I think that there was a case... Was was it justified? Yes, was it justified? No, 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 I was just saying, I think we can... You've gone? Sorry, there's a little delay. There's a little delay, Alexander, yeah. Okay, maybe we can pass this on to Scott because I think this is more addressed to him. I mean, I I, I will make my own observation, which is that I think there were justifications for the first Iraq war which are complete, which did not exist in the second. That doesn't mean maybe that the whole thing couldn't have been settled diplomatically. But, um, you know, I, I mean, you know, Saddam did occupy Kuwait and, you know, that was on the face of it an act of aggression. Anyway, I'll be interested to see what Scott has to say about that. Mm-hmm. There is a legal claim you're saying in the first one, though. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yes. That's what you're saying? Yeah. Yes, okay. I think so. Uh, Raul says, so Will Smith is Russia, Chris Rock is Ukraine, Jada Pinkett Smith is the U.S. neocons and NATO. What Will what Will shouldn't hit Chris and the tame joke was about his wife, but Jada Newland instigated and provoked it. <laughs> well said. Well said, Raul. Uh, Commando says, are they, uh, no, wait, uh, like, are they found or were, were they fo- found real war, but they were not ready for it? What they found was real war, but they were not ready for it. They were used to easy victories. This deprived them of flexibility. 
on the one hand, of tenacity on the other. For them, war is merely maneuvers. Well, I'm not sure who that's addressed to, but I think Scott Ritter has discussed all of this, what's happened to NATO, Russian experiences, at massive detail in the program. Uh, Zat, thank you for that super sticker. Darlene, thank you for that super sticker. Lion's Den says, we are fighting the Kazarian Mafia, plain and simple. Thank you for that super chat. Pauli says, still in Dutch MSM Biolabs in Ukraine. That, of course, is Russian propaganda. Thanks for all you do. Thank you, Pauli, for that. Uh, Gus says, hats off to you, gentlemen. Thanks for bringing Scott Ritter. Thank you for that. Rakabas, thank you for that super sticker. AD says, uh, the use of of expensive cruise missiles for precision strikes, but no modern targeting pods for there are SU-34s. I'm afraid this is a technical question. Um, all I would say is, I mean, if you're talking about precision strikes, it seems to me that the Russians have shown that they're able to launch them from massive distances. And um, clearly they have a very, very comprehensive picture of where all the major targets are across Ukraine, which has presumably been put together over um, the last eight years, if not longer. And um, I, I, I think that they're obviously able to keep a very careful track on what their missiles do. And I don't get the sense that they have had any real problems with those missile strikes, which continue, by the way, at an extraordinary level of intensity. Mm -hmm. And can I just say, if you look at like the missile strikes that hit like these training facilities where there were actual yeah. troops in the barracks, yeah. um, it looks like they didn't see anything coming. I mean, no, you know, there was there was no no hint of of, of a warning or anything. They, they didn't know what hit them, exactly. which is devastating and scary. Devastating. For, I'm sure for NATO. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Paul, thank you for that super sticker. Piano Man, thank you for that super sticker. AD says, how do the Russians actually gather intelligence in the theater of Ukraine and advanced is their technical intelligence capability? We answered this as well. Yeah, I think I so. I think, yeah. I, think, I think Scott discussed this at length. I mean, they've got obviously huge technical capabilities. They have intercepts, they have to do intercepts, they have human intelligence, and they have satellite intelligence and every conceivable type of intelligence. My impression, by the way, is that the Russians are extremely well informed about the order of battle and the command systems in Ukraine. And Scott Richards said that. I mean, he said that, you know, that when it comes to what the Ukrainian military do, it's almost completely transparent to them. Yeah. Edward says, thank you guys for your stupendous efforts during the world crisis. I look forward to your analysis on China-Solomon agreement when time permits. Uh, that's at the end of the Scott Ritter video, Yeah, yeah. the full analysis for that. Thank you very much for that. Ian says, Taliban used insurgency warfare against the Russians. Why can't the Ukrainians? We, we answered this question as well. Yes. Correct? Yeah. Yes, yes, I think so. Yeah. yeah. This was answered as well. V Bibi says the media here in the Western Canada is saying that there are hundreds in a grave and they blame it right away on Russia. I am so disappointed in our media and politicians. Well, it's mean, a tough one to we, answer because YouTube is, it's, yeah. It's being very difficult now, <laughs> not surprisingly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tyreek says, great job, guys. Kylie, thank you for that super sticker. Jane, thank you for that super sticker. Commander Crossfire says, was, was it a mistake to pull back from liberated towns? No step back in allowing such uh, uh, FF atrocities to take place. Well, the Russians must well, have understood the terrorists might commit such crimes. Well, uh, uh, Scott Ritter answered that. From a military sense point of view, you do not keep troops holding territory which has no value in the middle of a war. I mean, at that point, you're pinning down your own troops when you could actually use them more efficiently where they're really needed. So there's a military side to this. But he also said uh, uh, that, you know, the Russians didn't handle the withdrawal from a political point of view very well. And if his theory as to how this happened is correct, and these were people who were uh, killed because, you know, they'd had some kind of co contacts with the Russians, then they should have been evacuated or at least offered that opportunity. Mm. Yeah. Do you think this might have been... Uh from the political side of things, not the military. Do you think this might have been a mistake from the Russian side of things, from the Kremlin? And are they going to course correct? 
Well, they're not going to cause correct because they never do. That's the fundamental problem. The Russians are always very good at the hard power side of things. The media side, they're just terrible at, and they never seem to learn. It's quite frustrating for people to follow, <laughs> but that's that's the reality of it. They're very good at they're very good soldiers. They're very good diplomats. They're PR people. They're just all over the place. Hmm. Luciano, thank you for that super chat. Paul, thank you for that super chat. Gary, thank you for that super chat. Stephen, thank you for that super sticker. And Zariel says, Scott, please give us your professional opinion on the possibility and type of FF, as we all believe it is destined to happen. Thanks again. FF, well, false flag, FF. <laughs> yeah, FF. No, I understand what you mean. I, I think but, we may have seen it, Alexander. Yeah, I think, we've seen, I think we have, actually. I think this, this is the event that we've been waiting for, and I think it's now happened. <laughs> Uh, John says, greetings to an American hero for the truth. Scott Ritter from another former U.S. Marine. Yes, we showed that to Scott and we put that on the screen. Thank you very much for that super chat, John. And uh, Brainweth says, uh, it's great that you folks have Scott on. He's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Sparky says, Alexander's law experience keeps Scott on point. Thank you very much for that, <laughs> Sparky. Sparky also says, what about the woke CIA? <laughs> What is true? Fun? There is a woke CIA. Yeah. There is, a, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I'm. <laughs> Be wedded and says, "What about the uh, neo NAZI youth camps? They do exist. They do exist. Absolutely, they do exist. I mean, you know, I, I'm not. I can't. I can't say more. I mean, they certainly do exist, and they have existed, and they are responsible for the fact that you know there's these young men in these battalions who." get involved in these wars and do these things. <laughs> I mean, I can't say more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Toilet Sauce says, I find it impossible to believe that Russian intelligence didn't know that all the imported Ukrainian governors, mayors, and bureaucrats below them have been appointed to an ideal, have been appointed on an ideological basis plus decades of propaganda even before 2014. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Um, I... I Again, come back to this. I think the Russians are extremely good, even at hard intelligence. I mean, you know, knowing what troops are positioned, you know, that kind of thing. I don't think they're so good, and I, I this is a long-standing view, at political intelligence. And I think that may have taken them some time to sort out. But in the southern regions of Ukraine, in Kherson and Zaporozhye, they do now seem to have replaced all the people there with their own people and as i said in the program russian flags have apparently been raised over the administrative buildings in all these regions ian says taliban were were goat herders but still defeated russia in afghanistan well first of all it wasn't the taliban it was the mujahideen and secondly they got an awful lot of military supplies from the west and thirdly, I think it's a big question whether the Russians were defeated in Afghanistan. The Russians left, leaving a government intact. That government remained in power after the Russians left. It defeated uh, the Mujahideen in a major battle in a place called Jalalabad. And it only finally collapsed after the Soviet Union itself collapsed and cut and Yeltsin's replacement Russia cut off aid <laughs> and that it only failed following a coup. So, you know, I, 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 you know I, I think these points need to be made because, you know, I don't want to give the impression that I think the Russians are, you know, invincible. Obviously, they're not. That's an absurd. There's no such thing as an invincible army. But, you know, I, I, I think when people talk about Afghanistan, there is what well, there is what actually happened over the course of that war, and you know what the, the Soviet Union fought in Afghanistan. The actual reality, which doesn't entirely correspond with the sort of mythical narrative that we sometimes get. So I just I just want to make those points as well. Mm -hmm. Commander Crossfire says I bought a shirt. The Duran Eagle is conspicuously similar to the Russian Imperial Eagle. Yeah, but it's not. To the Greek it's eagle as Russian. well, and the Byzantine Greek eagle. eagle as well. Yeah. Well, you may always remember, I mean, all this started with the Byzantine Empire, so, you know, which yeah. is what we have, we're more connected to. But as I said, it is our own Duran eagle. It's not Byzantine or Russian, or Habsburg, by the way, because exactly. the Habsburgs also used <laughs> or the double-headed eagle. <laughs> 
Very true. Uh, Bauke John says, uh, what does Scott Ritter think of the very conspicuous exclusion so far of the crucial Edessa region from the battle? We talked about oh, we this. We did ask that what question. Do you think? We, had, we, yeah. we, we did, we did ask, that, ask that question. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's maybe in phase three. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, Phoenix Knight says, what are Mr. Ritter's thoughts on the former CIA agents speaking as subject matter experts on the Ukrainian conflict and Putin, and whether they are likely still on the CIA payroll? Uh, example, guests on Rogan's show. We can answer this. What do you think of these I people think he did that claim this, to be actually, Putin yeah. experts? Yeah. We did answer this, but what do you yeah. think of all these uh, CIA guys and all these people on uh, mainstream media who are Putin experts in the, in the I West? I think it's absolutely wrong, and I think that shouldn't happen. I think that intelligence, the, the, the function of intelligence officers is to provide advice to government, to the governments that they serve. It is not to manipulate opinion by providing um, intelligence or, 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 or information or even their own opinions to the media. I think that they serve the government, they serve the president of the United States. They're not there to manipulate uh, people's people um, people in that kind of way so I think it is completely wrong and I think that it ought to be and it perhaps once upon a time would have been a part of a contract uh, of service for these sort of people that you know after you leave your service you keep your opinions to yourself because I, that's the only way in my opinion that intelligence can really work otherwise it becomes political and it becomes contaminated and all kinds of terrible things happen yeah. V Plan, thank you for that super sticker. Alexander says, thank you, gents, for bringing truth to the people around the world. Keep brave as you are alone with just a few like you withstanding against all Western propaganda. Thank you, Alexander, for that. Peter says, do you think that Putin is playing the Western media for his own advantage, using their own force against them for a big reveal? No, I don't think so. I, 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 I wish it was as sophisticated as that. But from past experience, I don't think it is. I mean, bear in mind something. I mean, Putin has been losing the information war with the Western media from almost the time when he first became president of Russia. <laughs> he had a very brief honeymoon when they thought that he might be their friend, but when it turned out that he wasn't, they've been going after him relentlessly ever since, and it's got worse and worse with every passing year. So I, I don't think he's got some master plan to turn this all around. I, I don't think this is... Um, I don't think this is what um, this is about at all. I mean, I think he's finds himself in the same position as any number of other leaders do, that when the uh, when he goes against Western policies, when he goes against the policies of the neocons and the globalists, their attack dogs in the media come after him. And I'm afraid he just has to deal with that as he can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been amazing that Russia has not been able through all the advances they've made in the past 20 years, the media part has been the one part no, that they've not been really able did. to, well, to yeah. improve on. And when, but, when we mean media, we mean internationally focused, not yeah. domestic inside yeah. of Russia. No, absolutely. I mean, within Russia, it's different completely. But international media, they never seem to really try. I mean, even RT in its heyday, I never thought was really up to the, to the level of taking on the Western media establishment. Though having said that, I mean, you know, it, certainly made them very angry because you look, look at the measures they've taken against him. Yeah, yeah, it made them very angry. But yeah, I mean, they didn't, uh, by following the path that so many Western media companies have taken, i.e. focusing on opening up channels and, uh, and offices in various countries, uh, they left themselves open to uh, to being shut down instead of you know trying to go decentralized or on the web or a streaming service or something like that. That's absolutely you know I mean? correct. That is so completely true. And you know, Russia is the country, a country along with China, which has the technical would have had the technical resources to do it. But they never thought Yandex. Of that. Yeah, Yandex Yandex. alone, I'm sure, would have been able to create all kinds absolutely. of great stuff for them. Absolutely, but you know, they never thought of it. They never thought of it. Yeah. Uh, Zook says, uh, great stream. Thanks for sharing and, uh, caring respect to you, sirs. Thank you very much for that. Um, from Ago says, how can Russia spend one tenth of the U S military budget, but have supersonic missiles, ICBMs and combat efficiency 
What is the U.S. getting for the $800 billion defense budget? That's a huge question. That's a massive question. First of all, let's be absolutely clear about this. Russia spends an awful lot more on defense than these figures uh, imply because, of course, what you're probably comparing is, um, um, you know, spending according to exchange rates, and exchange rates can be very misleading about, about the actual spend of any particular country. But clearly, the Russians have a far more streamlined military-industrial complex than the United States does. And, I, I mean, I, I think that's a good question that Americans ought to be asking themselves. I mean, why was Russia the first country, for example, to field hypersonic missiles? I mean, surely, given the amount the U.S. spends on weapon systems and the importance of hypersonic missiles, the United States ought to have been at the vanguard of these developments. Yeah. Sea Dog 2K says free Julian Assange. Agreed. Uh, Erlaved, thank you for that super sticker. Cactus Ray, thank you for that super sticker. Karen says, I look forward to news from you all every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen, for that. Uh, Commander Crossfire says, denazify would require the liberation of the entire territory of Ukraine. Russia cannot stop at the Dnieper if they wish to accomplish this. Fail failure to do so uh, might result in regime change in Russia. Well, this is, I mean, again, I think uh, uh, um, uh, Scott Ritter has given his own opinions about this, which is that they probably will go all the way to the West. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm still, I have to say, this is the one point where I'm still less convinced. Uh, um, and I think they would be able, if they, if they stopped at the Nista, they would be able to bring the whole thing pretty quickly under control. But, um, you know, Scott's view is that they will go all the way to the West. Eventually. Um, eventually. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for that super chat. Eugene says, how likely is it now that, Ch how is it likely now that China will invade Taiwan? We answered this, but. Well, I think he did answer very, this. I think. Yes. I think very was the, was the short answer of it. Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah. I think very, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, Balke Jean says, Biden and the EU's only political survival is to quickly reverse course and start talking with Putin. He's not going to do it. I mean, in fact, to be straightforward about it, if he opens discussions directly with Putin, after all the things he said about Putin, especially at this moment in time, I think that he would look a def he would look defeated. I don't think he's going to do it. I think he hates Putin Sea -dog. personally. I think that's my own personal view. <laughs> I think they all I don't do. Quite why? Like the EU. The way, I'm, but... I'm saying all oh, the EU. The EU. Yeah. 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 The EU. Too. Well, I don't think they're going to do it either. I mean. How does Ursula von der Leyen come along and talk to Putin? I mean, Schultz and Macron have been trying to do it, but... Do you I think Schultz think likes this... Putin? No. Do you think Macron likes Putin? I don't really think so either. Do you, can you I think they had a kind leader? of relationship. Any EU leader out... Okay. I All think right. they had a kind of relationship, Macron and Putin. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably all but collapsed now, if I have to be straightforward about that. But I don't think, I don't think any of them can talk to Putin at this time in the kind of way that's been suggested without oh. seeing their, their position. I mean, they, at, at that point, I mean, they would, they would look like losers. Outside of Orban, is there any leader Outside in the of European Urban, Union well, I can't that see can talk to can Putin? No, I don't see anybody. Not one? Be straightforward. Not one, no. Orban can do it, you know. There's, uh, you know, if there's political changes in Italy and France and new leaders come up there, which is possible, then they may be able to do it. But at the moment, I don't see any Euro e European leader in a position to do it. I think this will take years to sort out. Bruno, thank you for that super sticker. Balkajan says, my theory is that Odessa will be the place of a serious NATO war crimes tribunal. A NATO war crimes tribunal. I'm not quite sure what you mean by this. Do you mean that the NATO countries will be well NATO there. is in parentheses so no maybe I think he I think uh, Balkajan means for Russia will have their tribunal in Odessa given oh, given okay. the oh the, I see um, okay well what, what happened at the at, at the theater and yeah yeah maybe we'll see yeah the the, the trade union building yes the, the, the trade union yeah yeah the trade yeah, union yeah. yeah possibly for Four five six one two three says, shame on any American encouraging the extension of this proxy war. Thank you, 
for calling an end to this with intelligence rather than continued fighting. The Prophet, thank you very much for that, 456. Uh, A.K. Lee says, this is the eighth analysis I've heard from Scott and always learn a lot. Factual, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Lee, Ian says, would Russia push into Moldova? I don't think so. I mean, bear in mind, they've got troops there already in Transnistria. It, so why would they pause? Is Transnistria... Further? Legally, it's Can you answer the Moldova. question? Is, is Okay, that's the question. Okay. Yeah, legally, it's part Moldova of Moldova. Moldova views it as, Moldo- as Moldova. Yeah, yes. Moldova okay. views it as Moldova. Russia accepts it as Moldova. I mean, it's a sort of mm-hmm. autonomous region within Moldova, but... Uh, 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 the forces there are are, are obviously in Transnistria. Um, so the Russians are already present in Moldova. Um, interestingly enough, the Moldovan government, which is a pro-Western government, has been working incredibly hard to maintain neutrality in this conflict. They've not imposed sanctions. They're anxious to keep the gas and oil still flowing. So I, I don't think the Russians have any need to march into Moldova. Hmm. Uh, C-Dog 2K says, thanks to Max and Aaron for turning me on to the Duran. Great, thoughtful discussion and knowledge is king. Thank you to Max Blumenthal and Aaron Mate. Gray Zone, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, highly recommended. Uh, Sarah HH, thank you for that super chat. FL64, thank you for that super chat. Says, thank you, guys. Uh, Sabrinel, thank you for that super chat. Gus says, thank you, guys. Maria Fernandez, thank you for that super sticker. Gus says, awesome program. Grim Zane says, I recommend an episode of the history of the uh, biological weapon usage. Someone like Jeffrey K. has covered recent uh, Freedom of Information Act requests revealing U.S. used bioweapons in Korea and China in the 50s. IIRC, mm. anthrax, uh, laden beetles. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Okay, well, we, we, we will watch this. I've heard stories yeah, about this use of bioweapons in Korea and China. I believe it's still disputed, by the way, but you know, I don't pretend to be any kind of expert on the topic. <laughs> Gordon, thank you for that super sticker. My tube, thank you for that super sticker. And Manjov says, uh, Mr. Scott, will Russians finally show their artillery superiority? Otherwise, after this war, the army may become too weak. Will the army become weak after this war? I'm not sure. I thought it would become stronger if it wins. But um, I, I can ask to this from a previous discussion with Scott, which is that and in fact, you mentioned this in, over the course of the programme, actually, that the Russians use immense firepower, and I think they will. I read a, a, an account, by the way, um, um, of a comment by a Ukrainian soldier who is currently fighting in the uh, Donbass, and he spoke about immense artillery being brought to bear on them in all sorts of places, in these fortified locations in the Donbass. So I think they are already using their artillery to an increasing degree and probably will see even more of it. All right. Those are all the questions. Those Thank you to everyone that sent us questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, the Durant.locals.com and Durant Shop 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Thank you. Take care.